Today on the channel, I got a very special video for you. This is a lengthy conversation with co-owner and co-founder of Numskull, Matt Precious. We talk a little bit about quarter arcades, where they are, where they're going, and give some updates on some prototypes as well as some newly announced games that are in the pipeline. So I've got timestamps down below. Get yourself comfortable, grab yourself some snacks, some drinks and everything, and uh, enjoy the video. But for those who are not initiated on Numskull in your history, could you introduce yourself and just kind of give your background and uh, how you started with the company? Yeah, so I'm uh, Matt Precious, the co-owner of uh, Numskull uh, here in the uh, in the UK. Probably known for our products mainly, probably for, well, for you guys for quarter arcades, uh, as well as other products such as tubs, our uh, cosplaying ducks, um, uh, and many of our products. Um, yeah, it kind of comes back to so I suppose not going too far back though, but. Um, it's, you know, the reason I got into this, I'm a huge gamer, absolutely huge nerdy gamer and nerdy movie fan. So I kind of, when I when I left school and had to go and get a proper job sort of thing, I, I kind of went, I'm, I'm going to do something I love. You spend too many years of your life um, working and I, I can't get excited about selling beans or, or whatever it would be. So I always wanted to be in some way, shape or form um, in gaming or movies. So um, I, I went to work for a company, which you guys will know uh, as EB Games, which mm -hmm. I think went to GameStop and we went to game in the UK, but basically the same company. So I, uh, I, I worked for uh, game for 20 years, selling video games, working in stores, lots of different jobs, worked in the buying department. Um, my last job with Game over the 20 odd years was commercial director of um, Game Australia uh, as well and did some work there where I met my business partner who I think has been on the show, Ben, mm -hmm. uh, Ben Grant. So we both worked at Game for over 20 years. I think when I started, the PlayStation had launched that week, the PlayStation. It didn't even have a one on the end. Ben. <laughs> <laughs> it was just the PlayStation. Yeah, just the PlayStation, um, yeah. Just yeah. the PlayStation. So um, that's when I started and absolutely loved it. Absolutely loved my my whole time at game. It's just I, I worked with I worked with a product that I went home and still did. And I think that's the difference. And I know it's the old corny saying, you know, you don't work a day if you do something you love. And it, it generally was. So, um, yeah, 20-odd years, man and boy um, a, a, a game. Um, and then um, near the end of that, I said both me and Ben were in Australia, Game Australia. Um, and I think the biggest frustration, so we both worked in the commercial departments. Um, and, you know, we were so excited about these games. I mean, I'm talking about we were working on things like Call of Duty, the GTA, some of these massive games, Metal Gear Solid. Um, and every time there was a launch, these triple A's, and we'd have midnight launches. We always, the match was always really disappointing. I mean, it was, we, we'd get to the launch and we'd speak to these match companies, right, what we got, you know, Call of Duty's coming out, this is Modern Warfare 2, um, and they've all got a T-shirt and it's got Call of Duty on it. We've got a key ring and it's got the um, the uh, box art on there and we, we've got, and it was just like, oh, really? Yeah, because the, the most a, basic phoned-in merchandise basic, you could possibly it, it was, do, yeah. It was match made by companies, not made by fans. Mm -hmm. And it was so disappointing. And we could, you just wanted, you know, the Call of Duty fan or the GTA or whatever the game was that they were coming in for, you wanted something cool from that um, fan base, from that game that you, you, you love. And it was crap. It was absolute crap. It was what we call logo slapping. Mm -hmm. um, and we, I used to, we used to moan and moan about it and say, you know what, why don't we go and do this? Um, you know, we, we, we had a few contacts through 20 odd years in the industry. And, um, we said, why don't we go and make products for fans? Um, so th that was the idea. Um, over a few beers, it seemed a good idea at the time. We sobered up and we decided to crack on with it. So we've now, um, the company's been going 12 years, 12, 13 years. Um, so it just started off with myself and Ben, um, just the two of us, and it, it's grown from there, really. So, um, yeah, it's it, it's been fairly odd years in the gaming industry now, which has which has changed massively since uh, PlayStation. To, oh, absolutely! Uh, you, to, you've seen various changes, whether it be you know consoles and you know nowadays to uh, more digitized movement as far as physical media now things are leaning more towards digital um uh, just to you know side sidetrack really quick 
what, what are your thoughts on that? Where, you know, the industry is kind of going more towards um, digital media versus physical media. It's, it's understandable. It's convenient. So I get all that. And I do the same. You know, I've got a PS5. I, I, I download my games rather than go to a shop and have the physical disc. But as, as a fan, and, you know, and I go back and when we talk about arcades, I do feel like it's lost its soul. Um, and it's, it's a bit like if you put it in the same way that I can go on my Alexa and ask for a, a Beatles track. That's not the same as having the vinyl. And the artwork and, and being able to read comes. read the you know the lyrics and the liner notes and you know hundred percent it's mm-hmm. too convenient and I think because of that it has artworks are you know what's the artwork for the latest release of you know we've Call of Duty or whatever but you know the box shop was a big thing having that that game and you know going back to the arcade days where sometimes because the games were so basic and basically squares and things on the screen the the actual arcade was the imagination they made that look amazing to draw you in to play these squares and dots on 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 a screen and i think as graphics have got better that's overtaken the effort behind everything else that went with it the you know um you know, even the Sierra boxes, the big PC boxes that you used to get on the shelves, things that were were used to entice you in and, and buy the game. That's all gone now. It's mm-hmm. it's uh you know, it's another square on a PlayStation screen that you click on or whatever. And um yeah, I feel like something's been missed. In the same way, you know, I miss LPs and I miss that kind of music side. I, I feel like it's become sterile, I suppose is is the right word. I miss I miss the old days of having to go somewhere to play a, an arcade game. I absolutely agree. And like to circle it back to arcades, I think something can be said about the tactile experience of, you know, the joystick or, you know, the the flight stick or the steering wheel or, you know, whatever oh, yeah. type of interface the arcade has. Like a lot of these games, sure, we can download them on a computer. We can have them at, you know, our fingertip and play any way, shape or form. But there's something to be said about playing it traditionally on the way it was meant to be played with a joystick or what have you that really kind of, brings home that experience full circle and really makes it much more immersive and much more enjoyable in my eyes. Yeah. It's even like, even when, when I was at game, we used to have midnight launches for games. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how it's like, what you had to queue at midnight to get this game, but it was the event and you were surrounded by like-minded individuals that were yeah. also excited about it. Absolutely. So excited. And it's, 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 it, that's gone. You know what I mean? You, you don't even have to wait till midnight now. You can preload mm-hmm. and just go on and play it, but you're kind of on your own. I know people have people around or you do it online, but it's 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 lost that kind of community getting together, beating someone or you know, in the arcades or, or on a machine or or whatever it was. So yeah, it's a lot more convenient. It's um but uh, with that, I, I I think you lose a lot. So yeah, I'm I'm that old guy now going, it was better in my day. <laughs> old man yells at cloud thing. yeah yeah exactly exactly so <laughs> things move on but yeah yeah i th- that's why i make quarter arcades i mm-hmm. pine for the pine for the 80s so the way ben explains it is basically quarter arcades came to fruition because you simply wanted a cool arcade that you could put on your desk is is that somewhat accurate uh yes completely accurate um i i think the beauty of um Ben and I own in the businesses. We don't, we don't, we don't have to ask anyone. Um, we say the beauty. Our finance team will say they're quite the opposite. <laughs> but, um, it's basically, you know, and I'm um, so Ben and I uh, have different roles, but I'm um, uh, the, the the creative part. I come up with the ideas, or um, and I always wanted to do arcades. Even the the you know the first day we started the company, I went, we need to do arcades. And, and back then, I mean. Now people are a lot more spoiled about these replica arcades you can get, but mm-hmm. there was nothing. And it, no, absolutely it, nothing. 20, 2014, yeah, there was nothing. Yeah, absolutely nothing. I was like, you know, and I, I, I pined for those days. And, and uh, you have a few more in the US than we do over here. We do have um, like arcade club uh, and ones where you can go. And um, I, I love it when I go to New York, I go to their barcades and uh, mm-hmm. and, and that. But they're, they're far and few between. So it was always something, and I always looked at it as in, I want to preserve these because once they've gone, they've gone, you know, and, and I look at it as, um, 
you know, um, you know, I like cars, like classic cars, like a, a Porsche um, 356 or, a, or an E-Type Jag or, or whatever. You can always buy a lovely replica model to put on a shelf. You know, I've never seen a, um, a, an Aston Martin DB5 in real life, but I know exactly what it looks like. So I've got a model of one and I can put it on a shelf. There was nothing like that for arcades. It was just like, that's just going to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, once um, they're gone, they're gone. They're gone. The you, dinosaur. You know, it, it, you'll see them on a, a Netflix show or, you know, you go and watch Stranger Things and say, what, what are those? What are those weird things in that in that room? So <laughs> um, so that was the, the the passion behind it. But basically, I wanted one on my desk, yes, is the, is the short answer. I just, <laughs> yeah, it's just something. It's, it's um, I, I always um, make a product that I would want and hope other people want it too. Mm-hmm. So what made you settle in on the quarter scale? I'm sure you had different ideas and iterations before you kind of settled in. Yeah, we did. And and, and there was a lot of rumors at the beginning that we came up with a name and that's how we made them, but it wasn't. We we basically got loads of cardboard boxes and and we kept building it because the, the one thing I wanted it to be was an exact replica in scale. So I wanted it to be fully playable but all the parts had to be um, the exact size that would be for, for, for that scale. So we got boxes and we built things and we were going, well, that feels a bit small. It was a bit Goldilocks. That's a bit small. That's a bit big. Um, and and we, we kind of went to quarter because it was just about the right size that it was playable because then what we did, we built one out of wood. Um, so our genius creative director, Carl's very, he's one of those people that can pick up some wires and make things work and not do all that sort of stuff. I can't do any of that sort of stuff. But um, so we made it literally out of wood. He, he, he got some, you know, Raspberry Pi and we stuck a screen on and and we just kept trying it until we went, yeah, this is this is the right side. I wanted it to be small enough to fit on a shelf but playable. Um, and we basically, that's how we got to a quarter. And Carl liked it as well because it was easy for him to work it out. So whatever he measured on a full size one, he just divided it by four. Um, made it a lot easier for for for, for, for scale. Yeah. Simplified math is always um, good when you're trying to create something from scratch. Exactly, Absolutely. exactly. So that that's why we got to. And then the name just came from we just sat and brainstormed some names, and it was like, oh, quarter. I think that's where you put in a machine, and it's quarter mm-hmm. size. So it was a nice um, um, coincidence that we got a, got a name that kind of worked in in both ways, really. But it was it was all done on playability. Simple nice, as nice. That. So I, I believe Ben mentioned you prototyped a Street Fighter II, a Star Wars, and a track and field. Were those just personal you know, love letters of your own childhood or something? Or did, yes. how did you come about prototyping those specific games? We, we uh, again, it's, you know, I'd love, I'd love to say we did a lot of, um, you know, uh, analysis and stuff. I think we, we had a bearing on what would be cool. And it was just looking at, I mean, track and field. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about track and field is, that that would make my top five, mm-hmm. uh, and I wanted to do so. Um, th- that was simple. I just thought I want a track and field, um, and we just looked at different kind of genres. Uh, we worked a lot with Capcom and Street Fighters, a very very cool machine. So um, we, we we chose. We tried to differ from the the different machines and and, and and asteroids. You know, if we'd have put thought into it and realized the vectors on asteroids and we probably wouldn't have done it. But if we'd have put thought into it, we'd have never made Space Invaders, as you know. So, um, <laughs> um, so yeah, it was just, it was just, just, just pick some different machines at different shapes and um, um, go from there, really. So, yeah, we, we, we did those in Carl in his garage, bits of wood, Raspberry Pis and screens. Um, they look really good. And especially track and field, because everyone was like, you, there's no way you can smash the buttons on those. Mm-hmm. Um, and you really can. I mean, it is fully playable because we've got a um, a full size track and field in the office, and you can do. Apart from I, I can rub them on theirs. The ones in our office has got the guards on. I don't know who did that to stop people doing the. Oh, that's terrible! Button. That's terrible. Uh, I remember. I remember watching people do it with like a, a hair comb. You know, they'd put it on there and they would just kind of like jimmy yeah, back and forth, a spoon and stuff. Yeah, and do all sorts of I mean, of crazy... it is cheating, but yeah. So I just want to put guards on it. So, um, uh, and that was that was the test. It was like, can we get the same score on this one that you can get on this one? And um, so, yeah, that that's why we kind of made and we took we we came to New York to see Atari and took it over there, and obviously Capcom. Um, for um, uh, Street Fighter and, and, and Konami and stuff, and they loved them. They absolutely loved them. And um, 
we got the 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 license for track and field, but obviously um, we're unable to do it because of the artwork. Mm-hmm. So we, we, we've done everything. We, we've got it all set up. And, you know, Ben was saying before, we bought the chariots of fire music that's playing on the end. And and then it just goes back to it. And, and I, I suppose that in a way, that's what I love about arcades is there wasn't probably as many lawyers out there and licensing and stuff. They just made cool artwork and stuck it on and well, never worried about yeah, it. Didn't again. worry about yeah. it. No, nobody's worried about preservation, you know, 30 years in the future of somebody wanting to recreate or do this. That was a, an afterthought for sure. Uh, exactly. Which is now, um, I wish they had at the time because obviously <laughs> the problem we've got now is, um, yeah, it's, it's the license with the artist, an amazing artwork as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they did say we could make it without, but it kind of goes away. Yeah. Well, it's not. I mean, the, the, the part for me about quarter arcades is it's the whole thing. You know, the artwork is is what makes them amazing. And, and not to put the artwork on, it's, you know, um, putting lipstick on a on, on a pig. It just You're just trying to it, – it really isn't the same. So um, – but it still pains me to the point where – um, anyone who collects these, we put a number on the back of each one, and there is no number seven because so, it was relegated for track and field. It was really a track and field, and I re- I refuse to. That will be track and field one day. So I've left seven. So it goes from six to eight, which confuses everyone when we have to count up what we've got, and everyone goes, "Remember, we haven't got a seven. Um, so um, I've not given up on track and field. I I, I really want that and um, hyper sports as well, which it was drawn by the same artist. So I say, okay. So if we can get that artist, we can get both of those um, great games. But um, yeah, so we took um, Street Fighter to Capcom, who loved it, and then um, went to get the license and obviously found out that we couldn't because another company. um, uh, New Wave uh, Toys? Yeah. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Which is so weird. As you say, there was nothing. You know, Mm -hmm. it always reminds me of, you know, every now and again, you have that weird thing with movies where two movies come out which are the same. You remember, like, Turner and Hooch and K-9? Or, yeah, uh, Dante's it, Peak, uh, Volcano. Um, yeah, uh, Armageddon. Deep Impact and Armageddon. Yeah. Yep. And Bugs and Ant Life. And it was just mm-hmm. like, it was just that weird thing where you, you, you waited forever for a, um, a you know an insect movie and then two come along at once. It was a bit like that. As I say, you know, we didn't know about them and I'm sure they didn't know about us. And it was just... Um, the way it happened. So uh, I think we said before, Street Fighter would have, we have, we have a great relationship with Capcom. Street Fighter would have definitely been the first one we did. Um, and we've still got the prototype somewhere um, uh, in the office. It's a bit battered now. It's, it's probably completely <laughs> out of scale. The wood was thick and stuff. But um, yeah, so um, obviously we, we replaced it with a little known title called Pac-Man. So that didn't do too bad for us. So yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So pro- probably a good thing, really. Mm-hmm. So that brings me back to a question I was going to ask. So, what have been some of the biggest challenges, past and future, for quarter arcades for you guys? Because you you've seen different iterations. I know you guys have changed manufacturing factories. Um, obviously, there's been licensing headaches with artwork and um, inadvertently, you know, finding out new wave toys and other companies who are potentially, you know, kind of dabbling in the same thing. What have been the biggest, you know, learning? mistakes or headaches for you guys yeah i mean the the new wave toys are like you know for me so many machines out there i mean I, we'll never get them all there's just too many uh, i'll try uh, but there is so many but so it, I, I think there's so much space to play in it, it doesn't concern me if my arcade or arcade want to bring in because it's just different variations the biggest headaches, I mean, the biggest headache, as you know, is Space Invaders. Space Invaders took us, God, how long did it take? Three, four years? Yeah, at least. Um, I mean, we did have COVID in between, so it wasn't we were working on it for for, for four years. But um, again, um, that, that, that was my fault. It was just when we were going through the games and it was just, I mean, Space Invaders is probably, you know, it's the Citizen Kane for me of the arcade world. It's just so iconic. You know, the why I look at, the, when I did Quarter Arcade, it was never about one machine. It's that noise when you walk in and they're all playing at once. The ambiance, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 100%. So it was always, the, the vision was always to build a quarter-scale arcade 
um, never about that one machine. So, um, and I just could never see that arcade without a Space Invaders in there. So we've got to do Space Invaders. Uh, and again, it's, um, what year was Space Invaders? 78? And I, I, it was me in the office that said, how hard can it be? Guys, you know what yeah. I mean? Geez, look, look how much technology has moved on. And as I say, we went and bought one, which again was really difficult. Um, getting hold of, a, a, of an original. Um, I think we got it from Australia in the end, and that's get it shipped over. It was just wow. insane. Um, so we, we got that over here, and then the more we spent on it, we the more, we're just like um, they were geniuses. How the hell they made that machine uh, back at then. the time? Yeah. 40-odd mm -hmm. years ago, I mean, it's, you know, the, the peppered ghost effects is just insane, absolutely insane. It just looks amazing. But then you've got the black lights. But even the way when the machine's off, they, they use dots um, that you don't see but then appear when the light comes on. I'm just like, it, it, I suppose if we weren't, it, it was one of those where you're just in awe of them, but also we got to the point where we hated them for it. We're just like... Um, it, even in it's still in the office, we're not ready to play Space Invaders again. It's just too soon. Yeah, because we had this thing in bits, and we were just hands on heads. It was just so complicated, and because I mean, we three D printed mirrors in the office, and we had to try and fake it. Um, you know, black light against LEDs. You know, black lights were so much better. They illuminated so much light. So technically. Space Invaders was the the hardest project we we we've, we've ever worked on hands down just technically to to make it work and that's why it took so long but um again the good thing is no shareholders it's not like we're answering. we just went it'll be ready when it's ready uh, 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 and to be fair to the kind of the community we speak to all the time they just went just get it right Mm -hmm. like, okay they were patient I, I applaud them for it um and i applaud really you guys patient. for sticking with it because i i'm can imagine there were several times you guys looked at each other and said do we cut our losses or two three times a day mm -hmm. uh, we we would sit there and go do we just why, why don't we just go and do you know um rally x or something we've already got pat man it's it'd be really easy to make a rally x we'll just put different fins on the side and um but um no it, it was um yeah there was a there was a lot of dark moments in there but it was one we knew if we got it right it, it would become our um you know key machine it's the one that we show people i think it's the it's the biggest kind of wow factor because of that effect mm -hmm. um, and i think it's the one people probably appreciate the most who understand how that works game playing backwards and and everything so technically that was the hardest but the weird thing is and at the beginning so from pac-man uh and then we did uh the gallagher's tato um gallagher's galaxians miss pac-man we, we used to buy every machine so we'd always buy an original get it in the office which was a great excuse but um but also uh, you know we would measure it to death and you know every angle um, but also the textures, uh, even Pac-Man had this kind of rough texture on top and you had to get all that right. So that that was brilliant. But naively, what we didn't realise is, you know, and I think you noticed this on Turtles is over the years, people replaced buttons, people replaced joysticks. Yep. Um, so we're looking at this machine and we're going, well, these buttons are yellow because this mm -hmm. is an original 1981 pattern. doesn't mean those buttons are originals. They could have been replaced <laughs> at the time. Exactly. At some point, they were original to somebody, but not that machine. Yeah, yeah so uh, just out of pure bad luck, we bought uh, from different places a Pac-Man, a Miss Pac-Man, a Gallagher, and a Galaxian at the same time. We had them in the office, and we measured it to death, and we made it. Um, and it was only um, a couple of years later, I think, again, I was in an arcade. We didn't have the, the coin door the 25 cents light up none of our machines lit up the bulb had gone in every single machine mm -hmm. um so we just presumed the, there was no light up. yeah it, it, easy no mistake light. to so, do yeah um and so that's why it's an error but it was you know and um, there's no light up um 25 cents on the original namco's it's something we fixed for burger time which is uses the same coin door and and, and shape um but you trust, and I think it was. Did you spot it on Turtles? Was it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but Guilty again, charge. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, look, but, but the, the one thing we've learned and we've built up this great community um, on, on, on Facebook is what we've learned now is we do a handmade sample and we put it on the group. And Absolutely. Do- you immediately because- get that community feedback. Everybody will, you know, nitpick it to death, which is, you know, a good and bad thing for you guys. But they'll let you know anything and everything that's not accurate, not, you know, as it should be, which is super helpful because a lot of that information gets lost at time. And a lot of these, you know, IP license holders, they're un- unaware of those type of things. They just know they legally own the rights to certain things. They don't know the devil's in the details on a lot of these, you know, intricate parts and colors and that kind. Yeah, e- even the artwork. So I think someone spotted something on Miss Pac-Man because we got the artwork through from Namco, but w- what you got to realize is the original was screen printed. There's no, there's no um, digital version of that. So what they did back in the day, they'd get an artist in to re- trace it, redraw it, but they, they didn't always do a great job and they'd miss tiny details, but they didn't see it and they slapped it. And we put it on Miss Patman and someone said, you, well, her feet are too high or whatever yeah. it was. And you're like, what? And they'd show you pictures. So, you know, and we're going, but we've got this from Namco. And Namco going, no, this is original artwork. And even in the end, Namco went, yeah, you're absolutely right. Our artist didn't draw it wrong. Um, so every other machine out there probably <laughs> had this artwork that were, 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 was wrong. But yeah, lights out, button changes, um, you made the change to us for turtles. Elevator action, we put mm-hmm. that up on the group, and we went to one of our arcade clubs to do that. And the, the guy there is he, he's forgotten more about arcades than I'll ever know. And he even he didn't realise the bulb had gone, and it was spotted on the group. And now we've gone back and put the bulb back in, so the instructions light up. But as much as you know, I'm a fan. You've got to be serious. I mean, you've got a turtles in your garage, don't you? Mm-hmm. Original. So that's what you need. Somewhere someone's an expert on a machine. Yep. Um, so yeah, it's it's a lesson learned. Everything everything goes on the group. So we do um we have a handmade sample, then we have a what we call a T1 sample, first tool sample, then it which goes on the group, then a T2 goes on the group, and a T3 goes on the group, and then it goes into what we call a golden sample, which is off the production line. So everything goes now onto the group in different stages and um they're much better at spotting it than we were so um. well i applaud you guys for number one you know showing things to the group and lending your ear to other people's expertise because it's uh, it's a common mistake for companies to just think okay we know better than everybody else out there and just kind of stick their nose up in the air and close the door and no, just absolutely. do things. We definitely don't know. And no one knows as much as that group. I mean, the, the, those guys are, are absolute hardcore. And you've got to, and you know, we, we've had some rough moments and, you know, we, we take the feedback, you like it or not. And, you know, it's often right. Um, you know, and we, we, if there is something, you know, we talk about postage or pricing, we'll, we'll try and we'll break it down for people and go, look, this, this is why, this is what it's costing. Um, and I think you've got to have that honesty. Um, and I think it, it's appreciated in the end. When you get it right, the praise is huge. So it, it's it's one of those you've got. You can't have it just one way. You've got to take it to to, to give it sort of thing. Absolutely. And circling back to just kind of that crowd feedback. I know you guys have done crowdfunding products in the past. Uh, you got the Polybius machine back there. Has there yes. been any thought to tackling more crowdfunding projects, particularly with something that may be maybe too expensive for a licensor normally or just you know passion projects for yourself that maybe aren't as easy to sell to a retailer yeah it's uh, the reason for polybius when crowdfunding so again um i i, I always uh, uh, as a, i love the story of polybius that myth i love i love those myth stories and it's such an, uh, an amazing story of this, 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 this place with the CIA and the men in black going in. And I love it. And it's just become through culture. You know, you saw it on The Simpsons. And I, I think The Last Starfighter was kind of based on this kind of Polybius sort of. Um, and I think Ernie Klein has it in Ready Player One and all this sort of stuff. So it was just, but when I mentioned it in the office, no one else had heard of this. Um, to be fair, a lot of them were in the twenties who went okay. for us. That makes sense. Yeah. Arcade. So I, I was. It, it's 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 a well it's well known within a certain community that 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 we play it sort of thing. So um, everyone was like, oh, "This is a bit of a gamble. You want to make a fake machine that wasn't a machine 
that was a myth and it was just like and i went yeah i said people they'll get it people will get it um but we just went well why don't we crowd why don't we put it on kickstarter and see how it does which i think was the way for everyone else to go we we don't think this will um so that's why we did it it was a bit of a so if it hadn't have hit that uh, amount uh, we 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 wouldn't have made it obviously uh, uh, and so so it was it was um it was that way but it, it did I mean, we didn't make many, um, so it's a real kind of collector's piece now is uh, Polybius, but um, yes. So, yes, I want to do more crazy things like that, So, um, uh, especially for the USB hub. So we've got the, the the two vending and the Polybius, which I think that can take you to a maximum of 20. I think there was 10 in Polybius and five each in, in the vending. I think mm-hmm. we're at two. 15 machines when burger time comes out i have to miss out the seven when i count them for uh, track and field um so we're getting pretty close even if you've got them all to um to what we do so i'm kind of looking at okay what's next um and it has to fit in so um one thing i was look- i don't think i've ever mentioned this story to anyone so the one i was looking at was what's the arcade machine you could never make quarter, quarter size. That was, um, and so I was thinking through, and I was like, "What? One of the, the machines I loved in, in the arcade was um, Operation Wolf. I mm-hmm. loved it. The Uzi, yeah, uh, uh, Tato um, eighty seven. Um, it was amazing. The artwork. He had like a, a wounded shoulder, a soldier over his shoulder, uh, firing away. I think it was. I think things like Rambo Part 2 would come out on Platoon and stuff. It was all like Vietnam. And it, it was amazing, but there's no way on this planet we could ever make that in scale, uh, quarter, quarter, quarter size, because you could never get the Uzi to work. We'd have to oversize it and and, and do all sorts, and it, w- it would look crap. And it's all about looking good. And I was like, well, do we make that into a USB hub? So bring that out. So it's got the screen and it looks identical and it's a great piece, but it just plugs in USBs. But when we started to make it, we're like, this will cost more than the arcade because basically I'm making an arcade machine. The only thing I'm not doing is plugging in the wires. Uh-huh. Um, the, where the, and that's not where the money is. The money's in the cabinet, which are all wooden and the replica. And the one, would you want to make the, the, the Uzi? full size but the screen will you put a fake screen i said no it's got to play operation wolf it's got all the video up there and they're like you've just made an arcade that doesn't play (laughs) it which doesn't play and now you want to put a usb pack in it which will make it the most expensive arcade we've ever made i was like yeah as much as i would love that i think uh uh you know a 300 dollar usb hub probably I, I, doesn't I make I, the most financial sense yeah no and i don't think you would get you know as much as i i would love to do it so but it's it's definitely something like that that i would um like to do something that you would see in an arcade that becomes the the hub and, and i i do have one we're talking to someone about which I'm, I'm hoping comes off which is a little bit weird and fantastic i don't know if we because Polybius did well i don't know if we need to kickstart it again it'll be I'm sure finance will want to, but we'll 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 say we'll say. But yes, we're definitely going to do more vending machines. Okay. Well, speaking of finance, uh, I know you guys have had uh, pre-orders for three Tato games that have been, uh, you know, big hits in the arcade for many years. You got Kicks, you got Elevator Action, and Zookeeper. How how are those pre-orders going for you guys? Yeah, they did really well. It, it it's an interesting one again. That um, those machines were a lot more common in the US than they were in the UK. Um, for whatever reason, I don't know what, who manufactured and brought them over. So you you wouldn't have seen those machines as much, whereas in the US, I think th- those machines would have been pretty set. And that's come through on our pre-orders. So the US has gone on our pre-orders. And the UK's done well, uh, but not co- – and, and that's what we expected. We expected these to, to do so. Um, they're doing really well. They're on track. Uh, I think we've got them down for October. Mm-hmm. I think yeah, that yeah, was the so ETA. The um, we've the we, we've we've passed. I think we've done T threes now. I think we're on the final ones. I don't know if we put the final ones up on the group or we're, we're about to. But um, Tato signed them off. Um, we're we're ready to go. The only caveat we've got at the moment is we are on track. Um, freight isn't. 
So there's a real issue with freight at the moment. Um, so, uh, and that's not just for our case, everything around the world. I think usually when from, from China to the UK, we're talking four to five weeks. It's now eight to nine. So we're hoping we can, we build in a bit of buffer and I'm hoping that buffer can still get it in for October. So we are on track, um, but fingers crossed the boats will be uh, on, on track as well for October. But they, they, they are ready. They are ready to go and they look fantastic. Nice. Good to hear. I'm sure people that have pre-ordered it are excited to hear that as well because you know it's it's, it's been a while since it's space invaders. Exactly. Supposed to, they don't have to wait that three three year timetable, but uh, it's also you know it'll be about oh, almost a year since you know they got announced and everything. So that's yeah. uh, it's pretty quick turnaround. Yeah. Um, what what's your guys' goal or roadmap for releases annually? How many do you guys have a set number that you're trying to hit, or is it just kind of come as you go as far as the amount of releases you have each time? Yeah, we're, we're trying to. I, I think with the we, we've launched quite a few since um, Space Invaders. Obviously, you then had the Turtles, which we started probably two years after Space Invaders. But I, I think at one point, Turtles could have come out before Space Invaders, but we thought people will will burn my house down if I bring out an arcade before Space Invader after the waited four years. So um, so we've had the Turtles machines. Um, we've got the, uh, the, 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 the Taito machines coming uh bubble bobble's been redone as well um so we've got a lot but i think as well we were very conscious that um we needed to start putting our money where our mouth is people were very patient on space invaders but if we carried on like that we people would just um lose faith in us so we've brought up quite a lot of machines and we've now quite a lot of machines but we're thinking at the moment between four and six a year. Okay. Uh, initially, when we started in the naive days, I always wanted to bring one out a quarter because it went with the name. Well, yeah, and, and then we waited four years. So, um, so, um, but that was that it because it, it's a fine balance between, you know, do, do, doing a lot of machines. You, you've got to be very conscious about how much money people have got. It's you, you know the machines aren't cheap. Um, so it's a balance between bringing out too much, um, but also making sure that um, people have got enough. And if they want to collect them all, or go, well, actually, you know, I remember Zookeeper kits might have been a different one for me or whatever. So we're saying between four and six because we, we're planning for four, um, but we might have um, a couple of cheeky ones come in throughout the year which we're very very excited about but um um contracts have not been signed but if they do we're, we're too excited to wait so we might we might we might slip a slip one in there um if, if it comes off good i hope it does especially you know yes. my sake collector's sake fan sake everybody out there uh, besides the quarter arcade you guys also have a, an interesting little accessory lines that you've You've partnered with uh, your quarter scale arcades. A lot of them you've got displayed back there. Um, is there plans that are just like the quarter scale line for your releases with the accessories, or are you just trying to kind of throw them out there whenever you guys um, come up with something neat? Yeah, I think it's it, it, it's got to be uh, an idea that um, people like. Uh, it goes back to you know um, my 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 missus is um, she she calls it a dollhouse for men. And she's uh, when she comes up and sees it as I'm playing and setting it out, and I've got the lights down and I'm playing the arcade. She might be right, but um, it goes back to to me. It was always about that arcade feel, and that's what I always wanted to do was build a set. So, um, and, and again, you listen to the community. The, the carpets um, that we did, which have sold really well, was part of that, and we brought out the wallpaper, the brick wallpaper, and the stickers and the posters and stuff. So. Um, we've always made stuff for our set. So when we're, when we're doing a shoot, so we've always, because we've got our designers are, are there and we've got 3D printers, so we, we've printed all sorts of weird and wonderful uh, contraptions. And then we, we look at it, and when we go to shows, uh, we'll often take our, we took the bins and fire extinguishers and things like that, and the amount of people that go, where can I buy that? And we're like, really? We're, we're just doing it as like garnish. Yeah, um, but people, this is just extra. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was just it was just to make the set look nice for for the shows, and it was it was literally that feedback people and the bin. 
So one day on the bin, I was like, "What? you know, we, we've been asked for this and we've got this community of people. I said, we could just 3D print ones in-house. I said, just do a set, do, do 100, 3D print them. We've got professional painters. Uh, and we did it. And I think they sold in like 25 minutes. Yeah, it sold out quickly. And I mean, we didn't, I, I, we didn't even make any money on them. It was just a bit of a thank you to the fans. And then they'll go, well, we need another hundred. I'm like, shit, no, guys. Uh, <laughs> it's not my, a joke. <laughs> yeah. My professional uh, 3D painter who paints models and does all this was going, what well, now? And I was like, you know, like, like a little sweatshop. He sat there doing painting all these bins and we're printing <laughs> them out and um, we've got to sand them all down. So it was great to do, but we went, well, guys, there's, a, there's an audience for this. And, you know, we probably, we thought it was just a few fans you know just the real hardcore that we've been to the show so um so uh, what i promised to do was we've now stopped 3d printing in house um um because it's just it's just not cost effective so but i have managed to get um i'm getting some samples i was hoping to get them for here but they're not so it's gonna be next week we've got three items um which if the samples are good we're gonna go out with, with the accessories and we'll, we'll, we'll definitely i think it's one of those if these sell we'll make more and I, and I think it. If people want it, we'll we'll, we'll make it. Uh, and we're very. We're trying to make these items as cheap as possible. This isn't a, a profit. This is. A, we're trying to do this as a bit of a for the community. If you want to build these sets, we'll we'll, we'll do this as cheap as we can um, to help. Because there's been some great pictures, and they're getting better and better. People doing these. Oh, amazing setups on the Facebook group. I've seen a lot. Uh, it's absolutely amazing and so there's definitely going to be more of those coming um so we we, we should have those up for pre-orders i'm just conscious because i've not seen the samples of these yet and if the crap we, we we will we won't make them and we'll go somewhere else so um i don't want to mention them until they're any good but if these samples are good i think we'll have those up in the next uh, few weeks nice for, that's very for, very for, quick for pre-order yeah yeah we want to um, we want to get them out there. I'm hoping we'll have bear good time up for pre-order in the next couple of weeks as well. Nice, nice. Well, that was going to be my next follow-up is just kind of an update of where we stand on some of the cabinets that have been announced, but you know, haven't been yeah, up for well, pre-order yet. So let's, let's go ahead and start with Burger Time. time. Yeah. Because um, Burger Time is the next one. Uh, I can talk with Burger Time because I've got one here. Um, they, this arrived, so uh, again, when we talk through the, the with T1, T2, T3, this is T2. So T1 went on the group couple of tweaks again from the group um which 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 is great and this came yesterday which is t2 uh sample but i'm i'm really excited about this i, I absolutely love that this is one of my favorite it, it's it's that the cab looked amazing i'm amazed more people didn't do that kind of cut out thing um but the game was so addictive as well it was it was it was one of those. So without further ado, I can't see myself in the picture. Can oh see? yeah, that looks great. It's just the coloring of it. I yeah, don't know what it, it's just the, the coloring that, like you said, the cutout really just in the chef set that sticks out. It just draws draws you in for sure. It is. It really is. And um, I mean, I actually own this game for the. Uh, you can get it on the PlayStation. I actually play it on the PlayStation, which is weird. Um, but it's just because it was such a. It's actually a really good game. You know, it stands up the test of time, but. It's an incredible cab. Um, this will go up on the group um, tomorrow, probably, for feedback. But again, it's weird thing. So this bit up here, someone will notice on the group, because we use the same moulding uh, as we'd use for Pac-Man back in the day, which seems. And they went, oh, well, it, it's not round. It, it, it's too square. It needs to be round. And it, it's tiny. Um, and we went... Oh, they're right. They're absolutely right. So um, because we'd use the same moulding as uh, kind of Pac-Man and stuff, and we're like, well, it's, it's the same machine. It's just got different fins on. But it wasn't. It wasn't right. So um, it, it's cost quite a bit of money, you know, several thousand um, dollars to get that changed. But we're just like, if I don't change, 99.9% .9 of people wouldn't notice. Mm -hmm. um, but but it's, it's that one little bit that irks you because it, it's yeah, what keeps you up at just, night because you're like, it's not 100% accurate right. like you want it. right. <laughs> Um, so um, that was part of the community uh, feedback, which again is just amazing. So um, yeah, this is this is the one. So as you can see, it is. 
Um, you know, I've not a, the guys are going over it at the moment, and we'll we'll see what the group say. But this is nearly ready, so um, that's going up for pre-order. Um, the only thing we're debating at the moment is the date, uh, and the reason I say that is this will probably drop in December. Mm -hmm. um, but any delay means it'll drop in January and um, pushes uh, it into the new year. Mm -hmm. And then you get and as, all as sorts an ex of retailer. Um, I don't want to be, I don't want to ruin people's Christmas. I don't want people to make that commitment. I, if, if there's any risk and it's not even coming into us, because even when it comes into us, we've got to get it to everyone. If there's a risk that this won't make it for Christmas, I'm going to move it. Um, because, you know, people will buy this for people as presents for Christmas. Uh, and I'd rather. Um, well, there's no, there's no, day. nothing worse than ha having somebody open a, up like an IOU or something. Like, oh, this is where yeah. your present would have been. It's a picture of your present. Yeah. yeah. I, I've been there. I've had that happen. It's, it's unfortunate. And there's nothing you can do as the person that's giving the gift and say, sorry, I tried. Yes, yes. And I'm like, well, we've got we've got um, three new machines coming and stuff. But I mean, the, the plan was always to get this out in, in Q4 this year. But uh, as I say, it, and it's not actually us, it's because of that extra four or five weeks um, freight. But we're hoping that gets sorted, it's something to do with containers around the world. And I'm, I'm hoping they can get that date down. And we feel comfortable, then it'll be December. But um, worst case scenario, it'll be Q1. Okay. Um, so that's burger time. Burger time is looking great. Uh, that one's on there. I mm -hmm. think next. So Pong. Mm -hmm. um, and Pong's been a bit controversial. It's, I think it's a bit, um, you love it or you hate it. Oh, absolutely. But I mean, just from the historical aspect, you almost have to include it just from its significance. It's, I mean, the game's so basic, but the, the, the cabinet, I mean, it's 1972 Pong. Um, it is incredible. I mean, it's a, it's a beaut. There's nothing like it. And and again, one of those things you don't think about when you sign Pong, because <laughs> the great thing about uh, Burger Time and Turtles and and these um, Space Invaders is we can reuse the buttons and the joysticks because they're all the same, the concave buttons. And so there's a lot of parts that are, are pretty similar. Um, Pong has nothing. No metal <laughs> dials. Yeah, and the little the metal dials that, that are on there. And when we, we will tool all this, we'll never use those parts for anything else ever again. Mm -hmm. uh, even the screen, the screen was tiny. I think it was I think it was a it was basically a TV in there. You know, it was just I think even it didn't even have speakers. I think the speakers was the TV speaker that was behind. Um, because another fan she said to us, Do you want us to put holes in the back so you get the sound down? I went, No, because it, 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 it didn't come that way, yeah. It didn't come that way, and which they they just find insane. I went, But it won't sound right. I don't know, it'll sound like Pong, it'll sound uh, like it's supposed to, yeah, yeah. So, um, Pong's next. I think Pong's just a beautiful um machine. So, um, that one is so where we changed when I was talking about the original machines, we stopped buying the original machines and we went to a much better method, which was we now 3D scan them. Because uh, we're at the point now, these 3D scanners are insane, they're amazing. It not just scans out, I mean, it scans. We have to go in and take if there's any dust on the screen, wipe it off, it will scan it. We, we, mm. we've, even if we wiped it off, if there's a scratch, oh, it will it'll pick it up. Yeah. Which so I'm we've sure got is a to nightmare. go in and fill out the scratches and, and, and things like that. So it's so detailed, but it means even though we had the originals and we were measuring, this is as accurate as you can get. It scans in color as well, so it'll even scan the artwork on the side um, and the bezel and uh, and everything as, as long as the artwork's the original, which we mm. we, we have to check. Um, so it, it's insane. So um, with Pong. Uh, was the first one um, we oh no Burger Time will be the first one that was 3D scanned um, and then so we've got um, Pong's 3D scanned as well so that's been put together from that and then next which we're 3D scanned as well and is with the factories Bad Dudes versus um, Dragon Great Ninja, Ninja. Mm -hmm. which is if if you had to pick one arcade that summed up the 80s it would be Bad Dude. Oh versus. absolutely I mean you got Ronald Reagan eating a cheeseburger you know yeah. you got ninjas and I mean, it's, it's so quintessential over 80s. the top 
it's it's literally a Stallone Schwarzenegger movie wrapped into an arcade. So mm -hmm. um, that one's probably going to be next on on the list. And then tomorrow, because we've had real problems getting hold of one, um, uh, the guys are scanning Luna Lander. Are you worried um, about that one just from a control scheme? Because, you know, it's one of those Space Invader type things where you can have a top down view and look at, oh, old game, easy technology, but you yeah. need control scheme. Yeah, yeah, we are. Um, no, not as worried as Space Invaders. No, I, I think it's fine. So we, we've got one. So I didn't realize, again, because um, I must admit, in the arcades growing up, I never saw a Lunar Lander. I didn't realize Lunar Lander was so rare. I think originally. It came out. It, um, they converted a lot of them to asteroids. So asteroids was a huge. I think they were both seventy nine, but Lunar Lander must have come out earlier in the year. And they put asteroids in the same Lunar Lander cab, but because asteroids from from it was just a smash hit, I think a lot of people scrapped out the 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 Lunar Lander and just made them into asteroids, which from a business point of view made a lot of sense. So I didn't realize how rare Lunar Lander is. Um, so we've really, really struggled to, because they were saying, well, scan an asteroid. And I went, it, it's not the It's not the same, yeah. It, it, but it's the thruster. Mm -hmm. um, because it's not even that, because the thruster had spring back. Um, so you've got to get that tension right on a, a, on a course, because that's what that's what I loved about Lunar Lander was you felt, because again- In control, I'm, yeah. Yeah, I've got Lunar Lander on my phone. I think Atari did it as a, a, a classic, and it's not the same. It, that pulling of the thrust there makes all um, the world a difference because it immerses you in that experience. Hundred percent, hundred percent. So I'm not worried about Lunar Lander, but um, we have to get that thrust right. That's what's going to make or break Lunar Lander. I'm, I'm confident with what we know now um, for the for the, the for the cabinet. You know, we've come on leaps and bounds in the screens. Um, we we're going to spend a lot of time on that thruster. So, but um, we we can definitely do it. We'll definitely do it. But that's why we we've, we've had to get the original again. We had to go to a an arcade club in Manchester that we found had one and especially brought it in for us. So, the only place I know that had one was Barcade in New York, which was the next step. We were going to get on a plane. Oh wow, uh, that's dedication. Get on a plane to go scan. Just, there was just no other way of doing it. You can't yeah. you can't fake that from from Google. No, <laughs> not, um, not well. No. So Luna Lander, as of tomorrow, will be 3D scanned. They'll go across to the factory um, and we'll start work on that and, and, and on there. So they're the next. So Burger Time, Palm, this, the order might change, but Burger Time, um, hopefully this year, early next year. But next year, we'll, Pong will be out. Bad Dudes will be out. Luna Lander will be out. We've then got Robocop. So I think Ben talked about this on the show. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like, you know, people say never never work with, what is it, kids and animals. Um, never uh, never work with multiple franchises. Um, never work with movie franchises as well. So I think Ben said on this, you know, uh, Robocop was um, uh, done by Ryan Pictures. Um, the software was sold to, uh, done to Ocean Software or Ocean Interactive in the UK. And uh, then Data East wanted to make the cab, so they had to get the license from Ocean Software. Uh, since then, oh, and then Data East sold it to D4 Enterprises in Japan. Uh, Orion Pictures was bought by MGM. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Atari now owns it just um, tree branches. Um, it just it's got this. So this is this is Ben's job. Ben does Ben does the grown up stuff. Um, he has to go and he, he's a bit like um, he's, he's a bit of a Miss Marple. He's got a like, detective and got to put these things together. So we've gone quite far with Robocop. We've actually scanned Robocop, um, 3D scanned it uh, and everything in there. But we're just, it's even got more complicated now because MGM's now been bought by Amazon. I saw that. So yeah. now we've got to go and speak to Amazon um, and explain what, A, what an arcade is and why we want to be doing it and who's D4 and blah, blah, blah. So it's got really, really complicated. So um, um, technically, Robocop's, you know, it, it, it's not that difficult, but negotiations have been really hard. So that one is um, uh, penciled in at the moment. And we've, we've got the same problem with Ghostbusters. Again, don't ever do movie license arcades is what I, I would tell people. So... <laughs> You know, it was Data East owned the cab, Sony Pictures owned Ghostbusters. 
we've got to do a deal with Ray Parker Jr. over the, the music. music. Mm-hmm. Um, but then the sound effects in the game were owned by someone else. And it's like, what? Why, why did you ever do this in the first place? So um, so this one, again, it's it's four people trying to, um, it's like herding cats trying to get people to agree um, uh, on these. So that one, again, is um, um, penciled. Hence why we we might have a more simpler, uh, and I'm going to say AAA arcade potentially <laughs> going to be dropped in. Um, well, so um, yeah, yeah, at least one. So um, nope. they're, they're, they're still coming up, but really pleased with Beggar Time, Pong, Bad Dudes, Luna Lander are all on track. Well, that's good. I mean, we like said we got three slated for October, and you've got another lineup, you know, for early next year as well. So I mean that that should keep. People satiated and happy. Hopefully, yeah. So that's at least four for next year. And it'll be the same with, um, and I'd like to get another vending machine out at some point next year, especially when we get past that Magic 20. Because we use it, I mean, I must admit, uh, I, I mean, I have this set up here and we have the one at work. Without the USB hubs, it becomes a nightmare of cabling. So. Oh, absolutely. They're, it's just, they're all tangled and you're stretching them everywhere and you're trying to, like, connect the dots and, you know, you yeah. got multiple USB ports and, yeah. If you didn't have those hubs, it would be and I and I remember before the Polybius came out, I was stretching them across and I had USB power banks, you know, yeah. daisy chaining together. It was daisy chain up. together across. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. I was I was the same. And then you had to try and hide the wires and yep. um yeah. So um uh, we will um I'm hoping more accessories, at least four machines next year. Uh maybe a cheeky five and six, and we'll see how Robocop and Ghostbusters get on. Um uh, and um, I'm hoping for another uh, vending vending machine, not vending machine, um, USB hub of, of, of some type um, to, to come out to uh, complement the, the the arcade um, on there as well. So um, yeah, we, we we've got those going. The other thing I mentioned as well is um, you t- sorry before you talking about Kickstarter, we have got a Kickstarter coming out, but we're doing it for. And it goes back to doing the research on the arcades. I'm amazed how little information is in one place on it. I mean, I used, I mean, you've got arcade music, which is amazing um, for, for, for dates and stuff. But I, I went on Amazon and bought a few books, but there's no real books. So we're doing a book. So we're doing an arcade volume one book, which um, I can't remember how many years it covers. Maybe it, it, we're starting in the 80s. People say you should start in the same time. I'm going to start in the middle and I can always move them around. Um, so probably from, I think it's 80 to 86, 87 or whatever it is. Oh, nice. Um, so it's a full glossy, but we've gone. And again, especially when we're looking at these, the grainy pictures that you get everywhere and, uh, and, and different stuff. So we've actually gone to arcades with um, photographers, and I think there's over 100 machines in this book, um, and we've took really good detailed pictures of the marquee, the buttons, but we've given blurb for each of the machines. So um, that's going to launch this year. We're going to do it as a, a kickstart. We did one earlier in the year on tabletop games, um, uh, you know, like the, the Caveman and Astro Awards and uh, uh, and things like that in there. So this is, this is the first one of a... Uh, an arcade, but we're hoping to bring out as well because th- there really isn't a lot out there, or the ones that are out there are really old. Um, so um, hopefully we'll, we'll we'll get that, but that'll be a Kickstarter later in the year as well. Good, happy to hear about that because, like you said, that really doesn't exist. Like the information that's out there, it's you got to piece it from here and put, put it over here with this, and then you've got a cohesive sentence together, and you're like, oh, okay, I, I, maybe that's you know a little tidbit i didn't know but as far as the actual pictures and stuff like you said there's there's nothing there's grainy photos of somebody's collection maybe and then there's yeah you know, the arcade flyers that originally came out but those have been you know crumpled up and maybe scanned on somebody's pc at best and they're been shared so many times that they've lost their you know resolution and they're super pixelated so it's, but it's, it's amazing it doesn't exist considering how big uh, the industry uh, is and the business, yeah, yeah. and the community, and, and we wanted to do it. And it's a hardback book and, and stuff because, again, it's like I love them just coffee tables. I love the you know, I've got like the art of Atari, and there's loads mm-hmm. of different um, books, and, I, and they're amazing. There's nothing better than that, you know, high gloss with the, 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 the pictures and stuff in there. So we made it because it doesn't exist. So, um, yeah, um, hopefully, people will 
will like that. So that's something we're going to do as a Kickstarter. Well, good. I'm, I'm glad to hear it. And like you said, going back to the made it because it didn't exist, you know, your passion project for quarter arcades, you know, you started Yeah. the line because it didn't exist and you just wanted something cool that you could sit on your desk. So You watch. obviously, There'll be, another, there'll be another five arcade books coming out at the same time. This is this is <laughs> K9 and Terror and Hooch all over again, yeah, isn't it? somebody will beat you to the punch and have the same idea. <laughs> It's like, why don't we do that? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. But, you know, great minds think alike sometimes. Yeah, So, exactly. Exactly. The more books, well, Matt, the better, that's what I say. absolutely. Matt, I appreciate you sitting down and chatting with me, quarter scale, just talking about everything. I appreciate your creative, you know, genius behind this because if it wasn't for you um you know we wouldn't have this brand i wouldn't have another addicted collection that i technically don't need but i still need uh, in my life so i appreciate that and hate that simultaneously but uh i, I applaud everything you guys are doing over there because i know you guys wear many hats you're not just quarter scale arcades you're you know the tubs you're the pins you're the clothing you're the merch We do, we do. We, we do have dedicated people on quarter arcades. Um, so the, the, the duck people don't work on the arcades and the arcade people don't work on the ducks. Just just one, one last thing I was going to mention was um, uh, we will be in the US this year. We're doing Cleveland and Portland Oh, that's right. September. It's, you're, you're doing some, yeah, some conventions. Absolutely. Yeah. So Yeah, you're doing so we, Cleveland. we will have them all there. I'll have Burger Times, definitely. The Tato's and Burger Times will be there as well for, for, for people to play. So we're going to do a setup. Um, I don't think I read, you've probably done both of these before, but I didn't realize how close they are together and how far apart they are. Yeah, as far as yeah, distance in between, but time, yeah, it's it's one weekend right after the next. But yeah, Yeah. um, they are completely opposite ends of the country, unfortunately. So traveling between the two is a little bit cumbersome. Yes, yes, we found that out. It doesn't look that far on the map, and then to, and then you put it in and go. I think it was fifty five hours to drive or something ridiculous. So, Yeah, not not exactly uh, something you know you you want to really volunteer for. It's like, yeah, sure, no, I'll load up the van. no, <laughs> it, it's got to the point we've actually had to build two separate sets because we couldn't get the set from one side to the other. So we've built two and sent them both. So and then we'll just fly in between the sets. That makes sense because you don't want to promise and then you show up to the next event and you're like, Uh, where's yeah, exactly. our stuff? Um, and it's our first real convention. Over, I mean, we've done like New York Toy Fair and stuff, but to, to meet the, the fans, and I've always wanted to go. So I'm, I'm going, Ben will be there, and Carl, the, the, the creative director, the brains behind these, will be there as well. So there's us three. So if anyone's around uh, and going to those events, I don't, are you going? Uh, it depends on my schedule. I'm hoping to make it at least to one of them. I'm right now leaning towards Cleveland, but it just depends on my wife and being able to stay home with the baby. <laughs> That's the only thing that prevents me from traveling all over the place. But um, definitely fans, if you're in the area of Cleveland or Port Yeah, please. Portland, Yeah. um, check it out because that'll be the first time they get to you know have some Yeah, hands-on experience 100%, 100%. We, at Burger Time and the Tato games for sure. we, we will have um, stuff there for the first time. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, definitely looking forward to it, Matt. I appreciate it. Uh, like I said, super grateful that you could sit here and talk with me. Like I said, we No, could do this for absolutely hours. great. Um, I'll, I'll come back on with Pong and Bad Dudes next. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, sounds good. Uh, in the meantime, everybody, definitely check out the Facebook official Quarter Scale Arcade Group. Highly recommend it. Like I said, you get sneak peeks behind the scenes of production units. Um, you just get to be surrounded by a community of like-minded arcade nerds, which is always great. And, uh, you know, It's always nice to meet fellow nerds like that, for sure. So definitely check it out. But in the meantime, guys, take care. Have a great one.